Dialectical Materialism by Henry Lefebvre. This is part four of chapter one, Dialectical Materialism. In the 1844 manuscript, the German ideology and all the other writings of this period, Hegel's logic is treated with the utmost contempt. Marx and Engels are unsparing in their attacks on this esoteric history of the abstract mind alien to living men, whose elect is the philosopher and whose organ is philosophy. The effect of Hegel's logic is for the son to beget the father, the mind, nature, the concept, the thing, and the result, the principle. The Poverty of Philosophy, 1846 to 47, contains passages particularly hostile towards this Hegelian method, which reduces everything to the state of logical category through abstraction and analysis. A house becomes a body, then space, then pure quantity. All we need to do is leave out of account every distinctive characteristic of the different movements, and we arrive at a purely abstract, purely formal movement, at the purely logical formula of movement. We then imagine that... We then imagine that with this logical formula of movement, we have discovered the absolute method which explains both movement and things. Every object having been reduced to a logical category, and every movement, every act of production to the method, it follows that every combination of products and production of objects and movement is reduced to an applied metaphysic. Hegel's method quite simply abolishes the content by absorbing it into the abstract form, into mind and pure reason. What therefore is this absolute method? The abstraction of movement, the purely logical formula of movement, or the movement of pure reason? What does the movement of pure reason consist in? In positing itself, opposing itself, composing itself, and formulating itself as thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, or alternatively in asserting itself, negating itself, and negating its negation. The dialectical movement, the duplication of every thought into two contradictory thoughts, positive and negative, yes and no, and the fusion of these thoughts, gives rise to groups or series of thoughts, and then to Hegel's whole system. Apply this method to the categories of political economy, and you have the logic and metaphysic of political economy, or, in other words, the economic categories which are common knowledge translated into a language that is very uncommon knowledge, which makes it seem as if they had been freshly hatched in the head of the thinker, and as if it were by virtue of the dialectical movement alone that they formed a sequence in which one gives birth to the next. Thus, for Hegel, everything that has ever happened, the whole philosophy of history, is nothing more than the history of philosophy, and of his particular philosophy. He believes he is constructing the world and the movement of his thought, whereas he is only systematizing and arranging, with his abstract method, thoughts that are in everyone's heads. Hegel's dialectic, therefore, appears to have been damned once and for all. Marx's first accounts of economics, especially the poverty of philosophy, purport to be empirical. The theory of social contradictions implied in the Manifesto of 1848 is inspired by humanism and by alienation in the materialist sense of the term, rather than by Hegelian logic. The division of society into classes, social inequality, can be abolished only by those whose material and spiritual deprivation is so profound that they have nothing left to lose. As yet, therefore, dialectical materialism did not exist, one of its essential elements, the dialectic, having been explicitly rejected. Historical materialism alone had been formulated, whose economic element, invoked as the solution to the problem of man, transforms and transcends philosophy. In their struggle to grasp the content, historical, social, economic, human, and practical, Marx and Engels eliminated formal method. The movement of this content involves a certain dialectic, the conflict between classes, between property and deprivation, and the transcending of this conflict. 
but this dialectic is not linked to a structure of the becoming which can be expressed conceptually. It is seen as being given practically and verified empirically. Also at this stage, Marx's economic theory had not yet been fully worked out, let alone systematized. All that had appeared were fragmentary and polemical statements of it. For Marx, the economic categories were the result of an empirical verification. They remained separate from each other and, as yet, ill-defined. The poverty of philosophy confuses labor and labor power. The theory of surplus value, surplus production, and crises, together with um, its political consequences, was not to be worked out until after the economic crises of 1848 to eight and 1857. We have to wait until the year 1858 to find the Hegelian dialectic being mentioned for the first time non-perjuratively. I have been making some jolly discoveries, Marx wrote to Engels on January 14th, 1858. I have thrown overboard the whole theory of profit as it has existed up until now. I have been greatly helped in working out my method because, purely by chance, Frele Graf found some volumes of Hegel which had belonged to Bakunin and sent them to me as a present. I have been browsing through Hegel's logic again. When the time comes to resume this sort of work, I shall very much want to publish two or three papers which will render the rational element of the method which Hegel both discovered and turned into a mystery accessible to common sense. On February 1st, 1858, Marx drew Engels' attention to the Hegelian pretensions of LaSalle. He will learn to his cost that it is not the same thing to bring a science to the point where it can be stated dialectically and to apply an abstract, ready-made system of logic. From this correspondence, it follows that, that the dialectical method was rediscovered and rehabilitated by Marx at the time when he was beginning work on the critique of political economy and capital. And capital. His elaboration of the economic categories and their internal connections went beyond empiricism and attained the level of a rigorous science, then took on the form of a dialectic. <clears throat> An important article by Engels, which appeared in 1864 in the Peuple of Brussels, on the contribution to the critique of political economy, indicates very precisely the two elements of Marx's mature thought. The materialist conception of history asserts that the conditions men live under determine their consciousness, and that, at a certain stage of their development, the material forces of production come into conflict with the existing relations of production. Having been up until this time a form of development of the forces of production, these relations of property are transformed into obstacles. A form of society never passes away before all the forces of production it may contain have been developed. Superior relations of production are never substituted for this form before the conditions for their existence have been incubated in the heart of the old form of society. This is why humanity never sets itself problems it cannot solve. <clears throat> the other element of Marxian thought, Engels goes on, is the Hegelian dialectic, which is the answer to a question which in itself has nothing to do with political economy. To wit, the question of method in general. Hegel's method was unusable in its speculative form. It started from the idea and we must start from the facts. However, it was the only valid element in the whole of existing logic. Even in its idealist form, the development of ideas ran parallel to the development of history. If the true relations of things were reversed and stood on their heads, their content would still pass into philosophy. Hegel was the first to try and show a development in history, an inner law. Marx alone was capable of extracting the kernel from Hegel's logic. And of re-establishing the dialectical method, freed from its idealist wrapping in the simple form where it becomes the exact form of the development of ideas. In our view, the elaboration of the method underlying Marx's critique of political economy is a result hardly any less important than the fundamental conception of materialism. 
The dialectical method thus came to be added to historical materialism and the analysis of the economic content. Once this analysis has been sufficiently developed to allow and demand a rigorous scientific expression. The dialectical method worked out first of all in an idealist form as being the activity of the mind becoming conscious of the content and of the historical becoming. And now worked out again, starting from economic determinations loses its abstract idealist form, but it does not pass away. On the contrary, it becomes more coherent by being united with a more elaborate materialism. In dialectical materialism, idealism and materialism are not only reunited, but transformed and transcended. This method starts from the simplest fundamental relations we can find historically in actual fact, that is economic relations. This passage answers certain simplistic Marxists as well as most critics of Marxism in advance. Economic relations are not the Marxist Sorry, economic relations are not the only relations, but the simplest ones, the ones found again as moments in complex relations. As currently interpreted, dialectical materialism looks on ideas, institutions, and cultures, on consciousness, as a frivolous and unimportant superstructure above an economic substance, which alone is solid. True materialism is quite different. It determines the practical relations inherent in every organized human existence and studies them in as much as they are concrete conditions of existence for cultures or ways of life. The simple relations, moments, and categories are involved historically and methodologically in the richer and more complex determinations, but they do not exhaust them. The given content is always a concrete totality. This complex this complex content of life and consciousness is the true reality which we must attain and elucidate. Dialectical materialism is not an ec economism. It analyzes relations and then reintegrates them into the total movement. The very fact that these are relations implies the existence of two opposed elements. Each of these elements is considered in itself and from this examination stems the kind of their mutual relation of their action and reaction on each other. Antagonisms will be produced requiring a solution. We shall examine the nature of this solution and shall see that it was obtained by means of the creation of a new relation whose two conflicting terms we shall have to develop. Although Marx never followed up his plan of expounding his dialectical methodology, and although he did not use the words dialectical materialism to describe his doctrine, the elements of his thought are undeniably those conveyed by this term. One can understand why he should have, dressed, should have stressed the dialectical form of his account of economics with a certain coquetry, as he himself puts it in the preface to the second edition of Capital, having previously come down so hard on all metaphysics of political economy. His method does more than differ from Hegel's method in its fundamentals. It is the direct opposite of it. Ideas are only things transposed and translated into the heads of men. The Hegelian dialectic has got to be turned inside out if we are to discover the rational kernel beneath the mystical envelope. The dialectic is a method of exposition, a word to which Marx gives a very powerful meaning. The exposition is nothing less than the complete recon reconstitution of the concrete in its inner movement, not a mere juxtapositioning or external organization of the results of the analysis. We must start from the content. The content comes first. It is the real being which determines dialectical thought. The object of our method of inquiry is to take possession of matter in its details, to analyze its various forms of development and to discover its inner laws. The analysis therefore determines the relations and moments of the complex content. Only then can the movement of the whole be reconstituted and exposed. When the life of the content is reflected in ideas, we may imagine that we are dealing with an a priori construct. 
In a general way, the concrete is concrete because it is the synthesis of several determinations. Multiplicity made one. In thought, it appears as a process of synthesis, as a result and not as a starting point, although it is the true starting point. The analysis of the given reality from the point of view of political economy leads to general abstract relations, division of labor, value, money, etc. If we confine ourselves to the analysis we vol 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 volatilize the concrete representation into abstract determinations and lose the concrete presupposed by the economic categories, which are simply abstract, one-sided relations of an already given concrete and living whole. This whole must be recovered by moving from the abstract to the concrete. The concrete totality is thus the conceptual elaboration of the content grasped in perception and representation. It is not, as Hegel thought, the product of the concept begetting itself above perception and representation. The whole, such as it appears in our brain as a mental whole, is a product of this thinking brain, which takes possession of the world in the only way open to it, that is, by scientific study. The actual datum can therefore remain always present as content and presupposition. Hegel had made a distinction between the categories, determinations of thought in its immediate relation with objects, intuitions, observations, and experiences, and the concept whose science for him was logic. According to Hegel, the concept had a far greater importance in truth than the categories. The truth of the categories came to them from the concept since they recur in the latter's systematic inner movement. The materialist dialectic necessarily gives the categories an essential role to play. They have their own truth in themselves, without needing to be attached to the concept in general and its purely logical development. There are specifically economic categories, which result from the relations between the mind and the content, the economic object. Yet the passages quoted above from the introduction to the critique of political economy see the categories as abstractions. The analysis would thus lead to relations essential to the study of the content in question, but which would have no existence or truth independently of the whole. What then is the relation of the category to the whole and to the concept of this whole? Is there an economic abstraction resulting from the subjective application of reflection to the specifically economic facts? How can we reconstitute a concrete whole with elements that have no truth or reality? It would seem that between starting work on the critique of political economy and capital, Marx worked out his conception of the dialectic still more thoroughly. The categories are abstract inasmuch as they are elements obtained by the analysis of the actual given content and inasmuch as they are simple general relations involved in the complex reality. But there can be no pure abstraction. The abstract is also concrete, and the concrete, from a certain point of view, is also abstract. All that exists for us is the concrete abstract. <clears throat> there are two ways in which the economic categories have a concrete objective reality. Historically, as moments of the social reality, and actually, as elements of the social objectivity. And it is with this double reality that the categories are linked together and return dialectically into the total movement of the world. An object, a product of practical activity, answers to a practical need. It has a use value. Under certain social conditions, as soon as there exist sufficient techniques, a production which exceeds the immediate needs of the producers, means of communication, etc., the object is involved in exchanges. What producers are doing when they exchange an object can be described in different ways, psychologically, sociologically, economically. As far as the economist is concerned, these producers, without being aware of it, are conferring on the object a second existence, very different from its materiality. The object enters into new social relations, which it helps to create. The second social existence is abstract yet real. 
the material object alone exists, yet its value is duplicated into a use value and an exchange value. These two aspects of value are never completely separate, yet they are distinct and contrary. In and through exchange, producers cease to be isolated. They form a new social whole. The exchange of commodities tends to put an end to a natural patriarchal economy. In relation to individuals, this new social whole functions as a superior organism. In particular, it imposes on them a division and distribution of labor in conformity with the sum of the forces of production and the requirements of society. Henceforth, producers and groups of producers in each branch of production must work in accordance with social demand. If the production of a particular group does not correspond to a demand, or if the productivity of this group falls too far below that of society in general, it is automatically eliminated by its, com its competitors. Society therefore distributes its total labor power amongst the different branches of production with a certain blind and brutal inevitability. The law of equilibrium of this market society emerges brutally from the generally contradictory or the general contradiction between producers, their competition. The process which duplicated value into use value and exchange value also duplicated human labor. On the one hand, there is the labor of living individuals, on the other, social labor. Use values in the labor of living individuals are qualitative and heterogeneous. Exchange value and social labor are quantitative. This quality and quantity are connected yet distinct and interact on one another. Exchange value is measured quantitatively. Its specific measure is the currency. Quantitative labor is a social mean, wherein all the qualitative features of individual labor vanish bar one, which is common to all forms of labor and makes them commensurable and comparable. Every act of production demands a certain length of time. The labor of individuals returns into the social mean by virtue of the labor time it represents, the objective and measurable period of time it requires. The labor times of individuals are added up and the total time the society devotes to production is, co is compared with the sum of its products. In this way, a social mean is established, which determines the average productivity of the society in question. Then, by a sort of reversal, each individual's labor time and each product is evaluated as being an exchange value, as a fraction of the mean social labor time. Social labor time, which is abstract and homogeneous, is not to be confused with the unqualified labor of the individual. Many critics have made this mistake. Nobody works out this social mean, which arises objectively, spontaneously, and automatically from the comparison, equalization, of the individual labor of competing producers. The exchange value of a product, and the currency is one of these products, is measured by the quantity of social labor it represents. The duplication of value into use value and exchange value therefore develops into a complex dialectic, in which we find once again the great laws discovered by Hegel. The unity of opposites and the transformation of quality into quantity and quantity into quality. Use value is concrete. Exchange value, the first and simplest of all the economic categories, obtained from the analysis of the actual economic content and a starting point for that movement of thought which seeks to reconstitute the concrete totality is an abstraction. Yet, it is also concrete. With its appearance, history has entered on a new phase, an economic development onto a higher level. Exchange value was at the starting point of an, an eminently concrete process. The market economy, which appeared a qualitative result of a quantitative increase, once the number of producers of commodities and exchanges had increased. Immediately it was formulated. This category reacted on its own preconditions, reshaping man's past, preforming the future, and playing the role of destiny. It is neither the mechanical sum nor the passive result of the activity of individuals. This activity produces and reproduces it, but the category is something quite new and necessary 
in relation to individual contingencies. It controls these contingencies and rises out of them as their global and statistical mean. Individuals alone had seemed concrete, then suddenly faced by the social object, the market with its inexorable laws to which they are subject and which exerts a force of circumstance over them. They are nothing more than abstractions. Yet between living individuals, there exist only living relations, acts and events. But these become interwoven in a global result or social mean. Once launched on its existence, the commodity involves and, in, and envelopes the social relations between living men. It develops, however, with its own laws and imposes its own consequences. And then men can enter into relations with one another only by way of products, through commodities in the market, through the currency and money. Human relations seem to be nothing more than relations between things. But this is far from being the case, or rather it is only partly true. In actual fact, the living relations between individuals and the different groups and between these groups themselves are made manifest by these relations between things. In money relations and the exchange of products. Conversely, these relations between things and abstract quantities are only the appearance and expression of human relations in a determinate mode of production in which individuals, competitors, and groups, classes, are in conflict or contradiction. The direct and immediate relations of human individuals are enveloped and supplanted by, by immediate and abstract relations which mask them. The, objective, the objectivity of the commodity of the market and of money is both an appearance and a reality. It tends to function as an objectivity independent of men. Um, men, and more especially economists, tend to believe in reality independent of the relations objectified in the abstractions, commodity, and money. I call this fetishism, which is attached to the products of labor as soon as they are produced, as commodities and which is consequently inseparable from the production of commodities. Fetishism is both a mode of existence of the social reality an actual mode of consciousness in human life, and an appearance or illusion of human activity. Primitive fetishism and magic expressed nature's dominance over man and the illusory sway of man over nature. Economic fetishism expresses the dominance over man of his own products and the illusory sway of man over his own organization and artifacts. Instead of stemming from an ethnographic description, the new fetishism and fetishized life stems from a dialectical theory of objectivity and the creative activity of appearance and reality, of concrete and abstract. In the first place then, exchange value has an historical reality. At particular points in time, it has been the dominant and essential category in antiquity, in the Middle Ages, in the market economy. In the modern economy, it is in itself antediluvian, no longer anything more than an abstraction, having been transcended. Yet it remains the basis, the fundamental moment which is perpetually being reproduced. But for the perpetual exchange of commodities, there could be no world market, no commercial, industrial, or financial capital. And it is in modern society that commerce, buying and selling, has reached its greatest possible extent. Like it or not, the activity of individuals is exercised within the framework, or within this framework, collides with these limits and assists in the continual creation of this fundamental category. Secondly, exchange value is the very basis of the objectivity of the economic, historical, and social process, which has led up to modern capitalism. As an essential moment of economic history, exchange value has accompanied the development of production and of needs and the broadening of human relations. Spontaneously, men have only an indirect and mystified awareness of this. They do not, 
they cannot recognize in the market their own handiwork turning brutally and oppressively against them. They believe in the absolute objectivity, the blind fatality of social facts, which they call destiny or providence. For many modern men, and especially for economists, the laws of the market are absolute, natural laws. Objects or goods have the absolute, natural quality of becoming capital. These men, economists or legislators, sometimes seek to influence these laws by procedures that owe more to magic than to science. Economic conferences, speeches, appeals to a mysterious and providential confidence. But to get to know economic phenomena is, on the contrary, to study their objective and substantial process, while at the same time destroying and denying this absolute substantiality by determining it as a manifestation of man's practical activity, seen as a whole, praxis. Because the actual content and the movement of this content consists in the living relations of men amongst themselves, men can escape from economic fatalities. Once they have become conscious of it, they can transcend the momentary form of their relations. They always have resolved and still can resolve the contradictions of their relations by practical methods with practical energy. The study of economic phenomena is not an empirical one. It rests on the dialectical movement of the categories. The basic economic category, exchange value, is developed and by an internal movement gives rise to fresh determinations, abstract labor, money, capital. Each complex deter determination emerges dialectically from the preceding ones. Each category has a logical and methodological role. It has its place in the explicative whole, which leads to the reconstitution of the given concrete totality, the modern world. It also corresponds to an epoch and the general historical characteristics of the epoch in question. The framework for events and actions can be deduced by starting from the category essential to it. This theoretical deduction must thus agree with the empirical and specifically historical research into documents, eyewitness accounts, and events. The era of the market economy was followed by that of commercial capitalism, industrial capitalism, and financial capitalism. Each of these eras is a concrete totality. They are linked together, mingle with one another, and are transcended. To each category, there corresponds a new degree of economic objectivity an objectivity at once more real and more apparent, more real because it dominates living men more brutally, more false because it masks men's living relations between the deployment of fetishism. More even than the commodity, money and capitalism weigh down on a human relations from outside, yet they are only the expression and manifestation of these relations. In the capital which produces interest, the automatic fetish is perfected. We have money producing money. Nothing at all is left of the past. The social relation is no longer anything more than the relation of a thing, money or commodity, to itself. Marx was to write in the conclusion to his theories on surplus value, studies intended to form the last volume of Capital, which were collected after his death and published in 1904. To man's activity, capital thus appears as an objective, alien, and autonomous condition. It becomes something at once real and unreal, in which the living relation is included. It is the form of its reality. It is in this form that it is developed, exists socially, and produces its objective consequences. The social and historical process, therefore, has two aspects that cannot be separated. On the one hand, it is an increase in the forces of production, an economic and historical determinism, a brutal objectivity, but this objectivity is not self-sufficient. It is not the highest objectivity, that of man's vital activity, consciously producing the human. We must not be taken in by it, like the fetishists. It is only a one-sided determination. The most objective is also, and at the same time, the most abstract the most unreal of appearances. From another equally valid and equally true point of view, the social process is the alienation of living men. 
the economic theory of fetishism takes up again, raises to a higher level, and makes explicit the philosophical theory of alienation and the reification of the individual. His activity, or the product of his activity, appears before him as other, as his negation. The man who acts is the positive element, grounded on itself, of the real and of history. Apart from him, there are only abstractions. Man's activity can be alienated only in a fictive substance. Men make their history. It is an illusion that the historical reality should appear external to living men, as an historical, economic, or social substance, or as the mysterious subject of the becoming. The true subject of the becoming is living man, yet around and above him the abstractions acquire a strange existence and a, mis and a mysterious efficacy. Fetishes, fetishes reign over him. The first of Marx's great investigations into economics was a critique of political economy. If we want to understand the fundamentals of his thought, this word critique must be taken in its widest sense. Political economy, like religion, has got to be criticized and transcended. The social mystery is fetishist and religious in nature. Political economy is a threefold alienation of man. In the errors of economists who take the momentary results of human relations to be permanent, to be permanent categories and natural laws, as a science of a substantial object external to man, as a reality and an economic destiny. This alienation is real, it sweeps away living men, yet it is only the manifestation of these men, their external appearance, their alienated essence. For as long as human relations are contradictory, for as long that is as men are divided into classes, the solution of this contradiction will appear and deploy itself as something external, eluding our activity and consciousness. Economic mechanisms, states and institutions, ideologies. We must rip away the veil from substantial life, Hegel had written, and this was the program which Marx was to carry out. Substantial alienation or reification denies living men, but they in their turn deny it. By knowledge and by action, they disperse the heavy clouds of fetishism and transcend the conditions that gave birth to it. Marxism is far from asserting that the only reality is economic reality and that there is an absolute economic fat fatalism. On the contrary, it declares that an economic destiny is relative and provisional that it is destined to be transcended once men have become aware of their possibilities and that this transcending will be the essential infinite the essential infinitely creative act of our own age the historical process that abstract concrete develops contradictorily the mere separation of exchange value from use value separates production from consumption and these two elements of the economic process will diverge until they enter into contradiction. The duplication of value is the most immediate and simplest precondition for economic crises, of which in itself it establishes the possibility. The capitalist mode of production is particularly contradictory by virtue of its tendency towards the absolute development of the forces of production, a tendency always in conflict with the specific conditions of production within which capital moves. The economic crisis makes manifest this contradiction between the power of production, relative surplus production, and the power of consumption, between the mode of production and the social con conditions of production. Once the antagonism and contradiction between the relations of distribution and the forces of production have been accentuated, then the moment of the crisis has arrived. The economic crisis is dialectic. It leads normally to a destruction of forces of production, both men and things. Thus, after a more or less lengthy period of ruin and upheaval, it restores the ratio between the power of consumption and that of production. Only then can the economy come to life again, reproduction be extended and more capital accumulated, as well as expressing the inner contradiction of this society, dominated as it is by the private ownership of the main means of production, the economic crisis also expresses its internal unity. It restores its, 
it restores its equilibrium brutally and automatically. It is, therefore, in such a system, normal and even normative. It represents the force of circumstance proper to this system. These crises occur periodically, each one being longer and more profound than the last, as an apparently natural catastrophe. By shaking up the system, they purge and preserve it. It is not the economic crisis that will destroy this system, but the will of men. Social conditions today are characterized by a dialectical inversion with regard to property. Originally, property was a right based on the labor of the person and on his appropriation of the product of this labor. Today, it appears as the right for those in possession of the means of production to appropriate the surplus value, that is, the labor time that has not been paid for. Property today is the negation of private individual property based on personal labor, but it necessarily gives rise to its own negation, the negation of the negation, which does not reestablish the private property of the worker, but individual property based on the conquests of the capitalist era, cooperation and the collective ownership of the means of production produced by labor itself. Subjectively, the man who acts, the natural and objective individual, also passes through a contradictory process. Alienation is not a fixed and permanent illusion. The individual is alienated, but as part of his development. Alienation is the objectification, at once real and illusory, of an activity which itself exists objectively. It is a moment in the development of this activity, in the increasing power and consciousness of man. The living individual is the prisoner of outside forces, but these are his forces, his objective content. By overcoming their externality and integrating them, he will achieve his fullest development. Wealth and privation, a religious outlook and concern for man's earthly salvation, an abstract culture and lack of culture, political theory and practical oppression. These have been and still are essential contradictions which tear the human reality apart. Yet wealth in itself is good, Abundance of goods and desires makes for a full existence. The state is an organizing power. Culture is the highest form of consciousness and life. Fetishes have a content. Fetishism bears on the form, and to transcend it means to discriminate between form and content, to transcend their contradiction and reintegrate the content into the concrete life of men. The enjoyment of riches, organizing power, culture, and the sense of community must be reintegrated into the free association of individuals who are both free and conscious of their social content.